Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. This is the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Throughout this episode, we will be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone. Today, we are honored to be sitting down and chatting with Councillor Joanna McCallum of the town of Canmore, Alberta. But before we jump into that interview, we would want to say that we couldn't embark on this journey without your support. If you haven't already, please hit that subscribe button. If you're watching this on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. If you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, hit the follow button. Every moment where you're subscribing to our show makes us better. It helps us get the word out. It helps us ensure that our message about delivering municipal issues right across Canada gets done. Now, on to our interview with Councillor McCallum. I want to thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it for taking time out of your busy schedule and your busy day to talk about yourself and talk about the town of Canmore. But before we talk about the town, I want to talk about you. And I want to start my line of questions with the same question I've asked every single municipal leader who's ever come on my show. So you're no exception to that. And that is, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Joanna? Hmm. Uh, my sense of duty came from, uh, that's a really great question, actually. So uh, I left home when I was 16 and I moved to Hamilton, Ontario, and I worked part-time for a television station. And that television station would record council meetings every Tuesday. They would roll the truck up on Monday nights. I would show up Tuesday at lunch. I would set up all the equipment, the GAC, the cameras, everything else. And then the real people would show up and do focus on council. And I got to know some of the councillors and one of them was a counselor named Don Drury. And uh, I would say that if it wasn't for Don Drury, I would not be alive right now. So Don Drury um, uh, had this role in my life where um, he basically opened doors and provided opportunities as a kid uh, who had very little and had did not have a, a an awesome childhood and gave me and opened my mind to um, opportunities within government where I could have agency and where I could bring agency to other people. And that's what he did as a three-term city councillor in Hamilton. He passed away about seven years ago. Um, uh, he lived in one of the poorest rated areas and communities in the city of Hamilton. <clears throat> and his focus was on seniors, disabled, and uh, the, the poor. And so um, from him, his legacy on me, he would say that I was his best project ever. Um, uh, but from him, I had the opportunity to understand the role that government could play in people's lives and what role I could take in that in helping serve the community and the people around me. So that could, uh, you know, I do a, a session with kids in grade six when they're learning civics and it's uh, called democracy in action and about how the things, the everyday things that you're that are important to you, how you can democratically improve your communities and your neighborhoods and your families and your schools and even your city hall um, through being being caring about what it is that's important to you. And so I would say I would look back to Don Drury, Dan Droopy, as I used to call him. To, when nobody was listening. And I would say um, that Dawn was the single strongest influence in my life as a young person that helped me realize that I had agency and with my agency, I could help and improve the lives of the people around me. So there's a lot to unpack there from that just I'm opening so state. No, but I love it. I love that you're willing to get this deep <laughs> because I know Hamilton, Steel Town. It, I I worked I worked at Queens Park, so I know the area quite well. I've been to many of Hamilton City Council meetings uh, when I was back in Ontario as a reporter. How does someone growing up in Steel Town become a now four term councillor for the town of Canmore, Alberta? Because I don't see how that leap goes from one of the most industrial communities in Canada to one of the most picturesque communities in Canada. Where does that journey take you? You're not the first one to see the juxtaposition. Um, 
And even in terms of my personality and how I've been known to be quite outspoken, particularly as I've gotten older, I've gotten a little calmer. But when I was younger, there was no calm. This is um, calm. <laughs> <laughs> this is calm um, and professional. Uh, so to be frank, I left an abusive relationship and I packed up my Volkswagen I took an interview over the internet in 1999. Uh, I got a job up at Nemtija Lodge, um, which is up on the Icefields Parkway, about 20 minutes north of Lake Louise. And I traveled the entire breadth of the country on my own to get away from said relationship. Um, Don Drury, the last thing he did before I left is he gave me $400 with a Canadian tire money, a subscription to The Economist, and told me if I screwed it up, I could always come home. Um, so, uh, but that's how I started. And I was, uh, up at Bow Lake for eight months. And then I took a job with an event production company in Canmore. And really when I landed in Canmore, it was, I realized this was the town that I'd always wished I'd grown up in. Um, I, and I've really been blessed to, uh, make friends with, uh, I've got, I, I joke that I have a foot in both camps. You know, I have a foot in old Canmore. So I know a lot of the Miners are the kids of miners, and I have a foot in New Canmore and Younger Canmore, the people that have been showing up in the last five to 20 years like me. I showed up in a time where a lot of people my age showed up. <clears throat> they came out from Ontario or uh, the East in general, took jobs in hospitality, whether at the Banff Springs Hotel. I know uh, people that used to be housemen that are now you know, managers of conference services at the Fairmont um, and have done the full gamut of jobs. And most people I know in Canmore, where they are right now in our age, have done the full gamut of jobs um, coming from Ontario in the mid to late 90s. So you, that's how I got here. So with that background, uh, and I, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth here, and I'm not trying to say anything negative here, but I got to ask fun. this sort of question. That background does not seem to say, I'm going to run for political office one day, because it seems no. like you would be more adept to get involved through nonprofits, through volunteerism. What was it about the municipal allure? And did you have a conversation with your so-called mentor to say, mm -hmm. Don or Droopy Dan or <laughs> Droopy, <laughs> Dan Droopy? Should I put my name forward for municipal office? What was the allure and the draw to municipal office in 2010 for you? Because you moved to Canmore in 20, in 1999 on sort of a whim because it's a job interview. You get the job, you move out there. All, 10 years later, you're running for political office. What happens in that 10-year time frame that you say, okay, I need to make my voice heard. And I think municipal council will be the best option for me. So the beauty of municipal politics is how nonpartisan it is. And <laughs> I would say, I, sorry, yeah. <laughs> not today. <laughs> yes, I know. And it, it may not feel that way for people, but I, I, I can honestly say that living in Alberta, I have voted the gamut. Uh, I, you know, I have, uh, yeah, I've, and, and a lot of people like me who feel somewhat um, uh, politically homeless when it comes to uh, partisan. And and I would say that, so uh, to rewind, uh, I think I knew when I was 18, when I saw that what my friend Dawn was doing, I knew that I wanted to do that someday. And I didn't know what that was going to look like. And I couldn't imagine it in a city the size of Hamilton but I could imagine it somewhere else. And so I tucked, I tucked that in my back pocket and got on with my life. I have done a lot of amazing things. I, I've, I've done event production, like large scale, million, $2 million weddings and, and um, uh, large um, events that have been taken across the province from venue to venue. Um, I've worked uh, with, you know, top stars in that field. I uh, was the operations manager for a helicopter company for th two years, working there for three years. Um, <clears throat> I worked at Lafarge. I waited tables. I bartended. I did whatever needed to be done to pay to pay the rent. Um, even when I was in Hamilton, the vast majority of my steady work was either waiting tables or it was um, in hospitality in general. 
Um, so uh, I would say that when I moved to Canmore and started reading the paper and um, getting myself involved in uh, local charities, I volunteered with the food bank. I uh, volunteered with Folk Fest for many years. Um, I really got to understand uh, <clears throat> some of the real challenges that was facing people in Canmore that were different than what people face at home or on a very different scale. So uh, I think that it would be fair to say that I have lost the plot of the question Was there I didn't take my riddle in this morning. <laughs> Was there an issue in 2010? Oh, an issue. Housing. Housing. It's always been about housing. Really? It's always been about housing for me. That has been my number one passion in this job. I started writing letters to the editor in like 2002, 2003, because the newspaper was bragging about, or there was an article that felt like it was bragging, you know, your perception at the time and what you know is it 20 years later is different about how we just sold our milli first million dollar lot. And my partner at the time was um, a framer. I worked in construction and he had guys that were sleeping four or five in a two bedroom apartment and, and we're sitting here bragging about this like amazingly expensive piece of land. Yet we can't house the backbone of our community. And so I think it, it that was the real impetus for me that and looking up at who was on council and realizing that none of those people represented me. None of them represented the same experience or the experience of my friends. And so I really felt that they there needed to be more of a voice up there um, than what was there. And nobody around me I knew was willing to do it. And I was, I knew how to campaign. I'd been campaigning since I was 12. So <laughs> Like my uncle used to uh, campaign for the PCs in London, Ontario. And I remember there must've been a by-election and I was staying with my uncle and aunt during March break because my mom was a single parent and he dragged me out door knocking at 12 years old. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, so I knew how to work on campaigns uh, as I, well, so I worked, also volunteered with MLAs and MPs on their campaigns and really got to see the the breadth and the difference of the issues that were being addressed by the different levels of government and realized that municipal was really where it was at. It was really where the change can really happen. You have to come cap in hand to the other orders of government for a lot of those things, but your finger is on the pulse. You, you can see uh, people invite you into their homes. You bump into them in the, the grocery store. You see them at the playground. Your kids go to school with their kids. Um, it's uh, it's a slog and it's a long game municipal politics in terms of getting things done, but it is definitely, in my opinion, where it's at. So you have just touched on a, a subject that I enjoy talking about a lot on this show, and that is the jurisdictional roles. And I know I'm probably the only person who gets his <laughs> jollies off by talking about jurisdictional roles and the roles that each level of government plays. Now, you are one of the few counselors that I've had on this show who has had three full terms and just in their fourth term of council. So I've oh, got to really? Just because a lot of them are two terms, a lot of them are one terms. Yeah. Uh, like I've had a few mayors who were long terms, but not a, a long term counselor. So I've got to ask the question that I ask all the time about the jurisdictional roles. In 2010, when you first were elected, the role of the municipal government was one thing. Now in 2023, it is a completely different beast. You are dealing with more issues that were once provincial jurisdictional roles or even sometimes even federal jurisdictional roles. In your opinion, and only your opinion, what do you see as the biggest change in what the municipal government is dealing with in 2023 compared to what it was dealing with in 2010? Well, downloading is is a big one. Um, so the follow up and, while you're thinking about the that. lack of leadership in one jurisdiction has led to downloading into a municipal jurisdiction, and I would point to housing as being one of those bigger 
things that in Canmore we really struggle with. Um, so <laughs> while you're while you're thinking about that for a second, I have to follow up on that because I've got to ask: Do your residents understand when they're talking to you as a counselor? what the jurisdictional role that you play as a counselor compared to their MLA or MP. Because when I talk to municipal leaders across Canada, the amount of times that I hear over and over again that I'm getting asked questions about provincial mandates, federal mandates, or even school board mandates, it would just floor you. Yeah. For you. Well, in there's the a of- definite hole in understanding in our education system um, I, I, there's a role for civics, uh, <laughs> civics education within not just like our kids, but like, like, like everybody. So, uh, is it hard also, to, is it hard to do your job when you have to explain to people that it's not your purview to, to deal with those issues? <laughs> like when people come talk to you about healthcare, because I'm assuming healthcare is something that is talked about mm-hmm. in the, ta- the town of Canmore. Is it, is it? that's not our purview. So go talk to your MLA or is it, we will try to figure this out because I don't want to just brush you off and make you feel like you're not being heard. I will listen because I'm guessing that there's some things that I I have concerns of as well. I have children, I have elderly Um, in-laws and I will try to direct people. And I I think I, you know, when I was uh, living in Hamilton years ago, I worked in some MLA and, or we call them MPP an MP's office. And there was, even though they were different parties, there was a lot of overlap between how those two offices would complement each other. So if somebody called the MP's office with something that was provincial or something that was municipal, you know, we would say, oh, you know, that's not our jurisdiction, but I'm going to give you the number of so-and-so, and and you're going to talk to such and such, and they're going to be able to help you guide you through this question. Um, and, and via V or, you know, if it was a city question, I don't know if those relationships exist in the same, those professional relationships exist in the same way now as they did almost 30 years ago in another province. <clears throat> and I don't know if that was, you know, politics in Hamilton's quite tribal. So, uh, but it's also a bit incestuous as well. Um, so you'll have everyone knows that, everyone in that city. Yes, they do. And some of them still know me. Um, <clears throat> you so, know, federally, you know, ahead. some people you would know some people, um, federally, uh, they would vote in one way, but provincially would vote in another. And Don was a perfect example of that. He would vote liberal federally. He would vote NDP provincially every time. Um, and uh, he also had a long-term role with the Office of the Worker Advisor. He worked for them for 30 years. And uh, so he, oh. in Toronto, so he had a an interesting uh, range of job responsibilities in different purviews. However, I don't, I guess what I'm saying is I don't think that that, that exists. You know, like our previous MLA, who I thought was a friend, even though our politics were vastly different, you know, as as a young woman, she'd been in my backyard, she'd been in my home. I was still waiting on a meeting request from September of 2019 when she, this, from this last election, like, so those relationships are kind of strange. And I, I would say that, yes, the public doesn't understand, but I would also say that the public with a lack of relationship with other levels of government, if they don't feel connected to their MLA or they don't feel connected to their um, MP, they are going to go to the most accessible person. And that is generally your your municipal councillor or mayor, well, municipal councillor. So the, 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 I'm easy to find. Uh, <laughs> Um, they, usually, you know. usually your cell phone numbers on a website or a business card. And I always find that strange that personal cell phone numbers are. Out there. I actually don't give up my cell phone <laughs> number that way. <laughs> I'll be perfectly honest, but uh, I am very responsive to emails. Uh, my home number, I, I am old school. I have a landline um, and, uh, and I actually am well known for always buying the coffee. I actually have a tattoo that I'm happy to buy the coffee and talk to my constituents. Um, that is awesome. For those who are not watch who are not watching this right now and listening to this, to go over to YouTube and check out the counselor's tattoo. Um, 
I want to talk about the role of a counselor for a second before we move on to a second segment. And I want to sort of ask the sort of semi-tough question because in the last 13 years on council, you've had to make some very tough decisions, I'm assuming. Right. And when I say that, I mean, you have had to pass budgets, you have had to make decisions on housing, and you are the most accessible level of government. When you go out to the grocery store, you are not going as just Joanna, you are a counselor at all times. How do you see your role in making those tough decisions for the betterment of the entire community, understanding the fact that you are not going to please 100% of your community on every single issue you put, you vote on? Mm, that's a good one. So <laughs> I think that the first thing, you know, how there's that whole, um, you know, accept the things that you cannot change. The first thing that I learned to accept the thing that I could not change is that I was never going to make all of the people happy all of the time and I also knew that every proposal in front of me I actually have this um, I've been quoted a few times and some people are probably sick of hearing it you can have some of what you want or you can have none of what you want you have to choose but you're not necessarily going to get all of what you want and so I think that that in, within the municipal realm you have the real the, the ability to be the great conciliator like the you know to to, to broker um, I hate to use the word deals because it sounds gritty uh, but broker agreements and arrangements that may not 100% satisfy everybody, but it hits a lot of the marks and you don't really want um, perfection to become the enemy of, of, of good. Uh, and so uh, I think that that is the approach that I have taken um, in terms of making decisions. Um, so can I ask a question before you move on? Yeah, sure. How do you know you do good? Because what you believe and what you vote on, you believe that you, in your heart, you're doing good. And I, I, I find this conversation fascinating. If you want me to move on, just tell me and I'll That's certainly fine. move on. But you have to weigh the pros and cons of what you hear from your gen the general public. And sometimes people are going to tell you their views and they'll tell you how you should vote. But at the end of the day, you chose this job and you got elected to make the tough decisions and you have to stand beside the decisions you make. So how do you know you're doing good in a community? Is it just general consensus? Is it when you put your name for it, they reelect you. So, you know, you've sort of got a mandate to continue to do what you believe is right. Kind of all of the above. So, um, I went FYI, into... I love this conversation so much right now. And I apologize if it seems like we've like went from like a really high to like really mundane, but I love the, oh, sorry. It's all right. Uh, I went, um, I think again, because municipal politics, in my opinion, is such a long game. Like you need to be committed to the, to whatever it is you're looking to get done because it takes time and time and time and effort and effort. And many ministers like, this is what my fifth MLA, sixth, I can't remember. Um, how many premiers have I been through? How many ministers of municipal affairs? Uh, I know that so, nine, sorry, 17 since 2010. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> God, that makes me want to cry. Um, uh, so how do I know if I'm doing well? So, uh, increased, I, 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 every term I get increased vote share, which is always a surprise to me because <laughs> I, uh, I know that I piss a few people off, um, <laughs> but uh, there's there's certain things I don't apologize for, and there's certain populations that I am looking to help and protect, uh, and I won't apologize for that. And it may be in some ways uh, not to the extent that they would like to see it, but that's actually a general study in civics because I am not the level of government that has the most amount of power to be able to make their ACE check better, to be able to bring in, you know, millions of dollars of investment for non-market housing, to, to do all of those things. But um, so vote share, uh, you know, people come to me um, and talk to me about different topics. And, and it's not because I want to talk to you about this. They're just like, let's go have coffee and talk. I would like to pick your brain on a range of topics, um, which I always find a lovely and thoughtful way I usually try to plan those on Monday mornings because I need that um 
Uh, it, but I also, it, you know, offhand remarks. So for instance, like I was in, uh, you know, Christmas shopping. I was at a jewelry store downtown. Um, my kids' birthdays are in January. So I'm like, like double duty in terms of presents. I'm a planner that way. Um, and uh, the woman looks at me. She's like, you look familiar. And I was like, oh yeah, what's your name? And I said, oh, it's Joanna. And, and it's not because I'm trying to like limit people knowing my job but my job isn't all of who I am like I am a mother I am a neighbor I am a community volunteer uh I um I'm a stakeholder I'm all those things and I'm a municipal representative and decision maker um so she made some statement like uh you've been in this job for a long time now haven't you and I was like oh you did recognize me right and I said, yeah, yeah, I have. And she's like, well, you've done a great job. I have yet to hear somebody say anything negative about you, which is a really kind thing to say and probably a lie. But and <laughs> but um, it was nice of her to say that. But I guess I just, I have a reputation and a, a reputation in all kinds of Canmore. Um, you know, my husband's in construction, so I know a lot of blue collar people. Um, I know a lot of people in the development industry, uh, but in the, you know, uh, in the weeds in the development industry, plumbers, architects, uh, um, but I also know developers as well. Um, and I know a little bit about construction and, um, my husband was born in Banff. And so he is third generation. My kids are third generation Canmore. So they're unicorns really, um, because so many people have been forced to move away. But uh, so that is how I kind of know I'm doing a good job. And I think also in the listening exercise, this is going to sound strange, but when there's a big hot topic and you're listening to a lot of voices and there's a full court French, like full push in a certain direction, I've started like, Who's not talking? Who's normally speaking, but isn't speaking on this topic? And then I will go and seek those people out and find out their opinion. Because sometimes they're within the same lobby, but they don't agree with the group. And you can get some really thoughtful information from those folks uh, as to their opinions on certain things that are happening. But because they're part of like, their, you know, whether it's the development industry or whether it's the environmental industry or a community or whatnot, it's like, who's not talking and why aren't they talking? Because they normally are. And then I go and seek their, their opinions, because I think that there's a reason why they're not saying something. So I have two questions I want to ask you before we turn to the next segment, uh, but I'm cautious of time here. So hopefully you have a few extra minutes outside of the 45 minutes because we haven't even gotten to segment two and we're almost at 40 <laughs> minutes into this. Um, I, I want to talk about apathy. So I believe, and this is me saying this, I believe there's a big apathetic nature when it comes to municipal government in 2023 right now. I think that there's not a lot of people who are engaged in municipal politics or municipal governance. I think there's a few people who are, but I think the vocal minority or the, the silent minority majority are not. Do you find that in Canmore? When you ask for people's opinion, are they willing to give it to you? And if not, how do you see your role as counselor in ensuring that you hear all perspectives on issues and not just the people who are willing to stop you at the grocery store, stop you while you're buying Christmas gifts, people who come to open town halls, but talk to people who are sort of more subdued and say, as long as my garbage is picked up and my water's turned on when I have a shower, I'm comfortable with the way the government is running. So the question is How do you how engage? And do you find, engaged. how do you engage and do you see an apathy within Canmore? So I see an apathy in general across the, our province. And I would say this last election, like I joke that I'm class of 2010, myself, Nahed Nenshi. Um, Don Iverson. Uh, Don Iverson. Um, oh my gosh. Uh, Giancarlo. Um uh 
and Bill Givens, although he was before, but that was, that was actually my crew was, um, uh, Nahed. those were your comrades while you were attending the yeah. AUMA conferences. Yeah, that was it. It was John Carlo, myself, Bill Given, and then in 2013, Mikey Walters. Um, and that was, uh, that was my squad. And then if FCM, we brought Charlie Clark on, we were the mm -hmm. ones in Edmonton for FCM that convinced him to run for mayor and knew he could do it. And he, with like tiny children at home, he was so exhausted and he did it and he's doing an amazing job. Um, Past guest of the show. He's 20... amazing. He is. I love him. Um, his sister's name is Joanna. So when I call him on his birthday to wish him a happy birthday, I have to tell him it's Joanna from Canmore, not Joanna, his womb mate. Can I, can I, I, I have to make the joke. It's, you have to say Mike from Canmore. Do you not? Yeah. So Mike from Canmore is actually living in Kimberly. Like the character that that was made off of, he moved to Kimberly like 12 years ago. It's hilarious. Anyways, but I know the the, the real Mike from Canmore and he's Mike from Kimberly now, has been for a while. Um, so I would say that uh, 2021 um, saw a lot of really great, dedicated municipal leaders leave the business. Um, and, uh, I was almost one of them. Um, they were tired, uh, the, the push pull of the pandemic, this, uh, hyper angry Trumpification of our civil discourse. Um, and it, and I think we were kind of hoping there would be like a de-Trumpification and it really hasn't happened in the way that we had hoped. Um, so uh, I would say that for the, the ones of us that stuck it out, that was a bit sad to see all those amazing leaders move on. Um, and also an opportunity in some jurisdictions or some communities to see a real refreshing of their councils too. So, you know, uh, Edmonton's had a big change and it looks good. Um, Calgary's and, had a big change as well. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and you know, when I worked with, uh, Mayor Gondak on, um, you know, her and I were the opposition to the Olympic bid. And so, uh, Jody and I have a connection in that way and our kids are around the same age. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, actually it's easier now to to connect with people it was much harder during the pandemic i think because you know if, if you if you door knocked and 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 you don't mind door knocking which i don't mind i like it actually i get a lot of energy from that from constituents telling me what they love what they don't love um but I think that it's a tricky question to answer because th there are the people that are like, yeah, my garbage is being collected. My water turns on, my toilet's flush, good to go. Uh, there's a perception that our taxes are, because our property is so high, that our taxes in Canmore are so high, where we're actually at a per door level in the mid range, which is interesting. Um, people leave Canmore to go to Cochrane, but the taxes are much higher in Cochrane. Um, and we're also a community of small businesses. And I think that the last couple of years, it's been really hard to connect with those folks because they've been just so busy trying to keep the doors open. Um, and I would say that even in our COVID recovery, you know, we really focused on small business. The big businesses were going to be just fine. Um <clears throat> We are a community of small businesses per capita. We have um, more than most. Um, and so I think that it made it, it, it was tricky. And I, I can't say that I actually have the silver uh, bullet answer on that question. So, so the follow-up question. I hope question. people contact me. People do talk to me. Um, they don't seem to be afraid to talk to me about different issues i think um, it's more that they just know that you're going to buy them a coffee <laughs> coffee's expensive but that's okay <laughs> um you you brought up something that it was going to be my last question before we turn on the issues of this uh the town of canmore 
-hmm. And that is the one big decision that you have to make over the next few months, if you haven't already made it. And that is the budget of 2023. Mm. You talk about affordability crisis and it is massive right now. And I can imagine it is even hurting communities like yours. Um, yes. You are the closest to the people you impact mm. them the day after you make a decision. So we are seeing cities and t- communities across Canada seeing tax increases of 8%, 6%. One community, I just saw, I read this morning as of recording this, 39% tax increase to their bills this year because they have to pay for things. And the federal and provincial governments are not coming to the table as quickly as municipalities need them. How do you make sure that you are not impacting people negatively in an affordability crisis with the understanding Mm -hmm. that you need to keep your community growing. You need to keep the water turned on, the roads plowed, but the cost of doing business is continuously going up and you have to try and find cost-saving measures or increase your taxes a little bit to offset those increases. How do you do that in a community like yours? Well, uh, yeah, so we have uh, we've been um, found to have the highest income disparity in the country, from what I understand, between rich and poor. Um, and it's always interesting because I remember I think five or six years ago seeing a slide in a presentation where the you know on average for every dollar earned, it's five cents of it comes from investment income, whether it's a RIF or a pension or whatever. In Canmore, it's 20 cents. So it really speaks to um, that, again, that disparity, that have and have not. Um, And I will echo uh, Nehed Nenshi in saying that property tax is uh, a very blunt tool and a poor way of of assessing wealth. But it's the only tool that we are given outside of user fees, which we've really tried to, you know, balance that out through our user pay as opposed to it being spread around um last year we had a 12 percent tax increase this year we're looking at 7.8 percent we are receiving half the grants from the province that we have if not less than we had in and prior i don't have the statistic in front of me I actually think it's does, does it make your hard job does it make your job harder because you know that this is just the reality that we live in, but you see people and we're going back to Don here back in Hamilton, senior, disabled, the poor you want to advocate for, but to do that, you're going to have to sort of increase that wedge between the haves and have nots. Have not. Yeah, for sure. So what, you know, uh, I can give you an idea of what we did during the pandemic uh, to sort of give you an idea as to my philosophy. So um, pandemic hit, we reopened our freshly approved budget from from the, the December prior, and uh, we had a massive surplus coming. And instead of taking that surplus and applying it to taxes, because of course, those that would benefit the most from that needed the help the least based on how... Me- property taxes structured and the mill rate. Um, we took that uh, surplus. And in my, the way I visualize it, I, I wrote a white paper basically to my council stating, why don't we do something different? Why don't we take that surplus and insert it into the middle of our community as opposed to applying it across the board? We also had a, had noticed a change in structure and um there had been some errors in the way our some of our hotels had been assessed. And so we had a much larger pot of um, payment. It just meant that that some, it was being spread around a lot better. So actually businesses, whether we touch the tax rate or not, businesses were actually going to see in general, except for five, a decrease in their taxes that year, which was blind luck. Obviously it was a calculating on an error. Um, and, um, we came up with, uh, a, a beefier affordability services program. We provided, um, uh, different types of childcare for people in the community, for their kids. 
we uh, came up with um, a business mentoring because of course there's going to be businesses that fail during the pandemic, but we also knew that there was going to be new businesses that were going to come out of that as well. And so how do we support them both? But the focus was on small business, because as I said before, the larger businesses will take care of themselves. Um, and so we, you know, I think that really helped lead the way we we recovered from uh, COVID and we are not fully recovered. You know, I think that the people in our community that have suffered the most are the, the workforce that were forward facing, that were dealing with the public every day. Um, and, and we are seeing, you know, uh, uh, in Lake Louise, you saw uh, a, a young person have a mental breakdown and, and light staff accommodation on fire. Um, we are seeing examples every day of how the workforce of our community have suffered. And, and we're now just seeing the aftershocks of that. And then you add on um, housing needs and um, uh, just basic needs. The, the three biggest expenses to people uh, on our living wage calculation are housing, um, uh, transportation, uh, daycare slash food. Um, and we have free public transit in Canmore. I don't know if you realize that, that we have fair free transit in Canmore and our um, parking, which is paid for uh, mostly by visitors, is um, paying for that fair free transit, which is a lever that we've been able to pull to, to, to help with affordability in our community. Um, uh, we have an affordability services program. We have a second tier to it now to, to deal with uh, higher incomes because now, you know, we, we used to talk about affordable housing. I ditched that terminology five years ago. It's income appropriate housing. It's, it's about, it's not about, you know, when you start having conversations about affordable housing, you spend so much time wasted on the elevator pitch but what kind of housing? Who's it to serve? Bloody, bloody, blah. It doesn't what's really considered matter. affordable? Yeah, what's considered affordable? What's the earning? Well, the earning rate here and the earning rate in Edmonton, like two different that's things. Like apples to carburetors, right? So um it's <laughs> it, percentages don't help either when we talk about like what's 7.8% in Canmore versus 7.8% in Calgary is what I've read. So 7.8% in Canmore reads as about $12 per month increase um, on the municipal side. We as a municipality long ago decided to stop taking responsibility for the provincial side of the tax bill. And we make it very clear as best as possible that, and, and in our community, half of your bill is provincial tax. In most other communities, it's a third. Yeah. So it really shows the tax room that we could use based on whether other municipalities are using, but we have really worked hard to, to not. Um, many, you know, our budget is a mostly status quo budget. Any of the additions that have gone in really are safety related or, um, you know, to deal and manage um, uh, low income populations. Um, we just passed, you know, um, an area structure plan on a very large swath of property uh, that is owned and controlled by the municipality. And we're really excited. And this is something that sort of came out of the Olympics in 2018. It was like, this is our next step. We need to do this. Um, we need to become our own developer. We need to grab our fate and drive it through. So that is really what um, we've been doing from a housing front. I'm not really answering your question very well. Y you are. And it brings me to a sort of segment, uh, the next segment, because I am yeah. cautious of time here. Um, and I want to talk about, I, I, you know what, we talked about the issues already, and we've talked about them kind of in depth with the housing affordability crisis, housing. But I want to talk about my favorite subject, and I think it's your favorite subject as well from the research I've done on you. And I want to talk about tourism. I love tourism. I think tourism is an undiscovered, untapped potential that municipalities sort of don't do well, but they do it okay, in my opinion. So, in your opinion, what are some of the hidden gems? And I say hidden gems because I don't want the traditional tourist spots. I want to know... Where do you tell people to go in Canmore to just escape a little bit and see the true Canmore and not just what 
potentially the tourist destinations want you to see. Oh, I am ground zero of keeping it real. It's true. And the worst part is I joke that I'm a dirtbag backpacker disguised as some mother, which I totally am, and an executive couch surfer. Um, I, oh, okay. Bingo at the Legion on Friday nights. The best. The patio at the Legion in the summer the best the food at the legion the best and that's not because i'm on the executive that's just new to me this year um but we have a beautiful like centrally located legion and i actually like i was just in roslyn for a conference a few uh, weeks ago and checked out their legion because i'm trying to figure out i, I'm, I actually just finished some nonprofit studies through the U university of toronto and one of the statistics was 10% of the Royal Canadian Legions in Canada closed from the pandemic. And, and a lot of these uh, organizations are nonprofits. They're important to the community and they, they tend to occupy really important real estate um, like uh, uh, within, within especially small communities. Anyways, I'll just brought, bring that up. Um, Tanmore has over 70 kilometers of trails and I don't mean like hiking up trails um I mean like wander around town trails I have a friend of mine Heather Nelson and she is an amazing you know um amateur photographer and she walks every day and she calls it her bench tour so along most of our trail trails there are benches and um she she'll be like bench tour 2023 she just got over surgery and she was part of the getting better was having to walk a bit more every day and so she was doing these bench chores in particular through spring creek mountain village um, which is right in the heart of canmore um but you know the engine bridge which a lot of people saw uh in the movies last year at the last of us that on tv um i don't watch tv much can you tell um and uh there's two times of year that I like to call peak Canmore. So peak Canmore in the fall is when the larches are out and it's still warm. Like there's still people on the water, whether they're fishing or canoeing or uh, whatever, or they're just hanging out on the shore. And, and I've never seen the Bow River used so much by people that I have in the last five or six years. It's incredible. I think that's also, you know, because of the heat that we've been experiencing in the smoke and, and whatnot, but it's just, it's been incredible to watch. Um, so that is one of my favorite times of year in Canmore. And my other favorite time of year is that like cusp between spring skiing and real spring. So people are wearing short pants and they're on their townies with a pair of skis slung over their, over their shoulders, right? Um, and then the dog sledders will come over the row, 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 with their dogs over the bridge, right? And, um, you know, people are wearing their puffy jackets and short pants. And it's just this, like, this, the smooshing of the seasons that you never, ever saw growing up in Ontario. Um, and that is uh, my other favorite time of year. And I, again, I call that, that one is peak, peak Canmore, not just peak Canmore, mm -hmm. but that is my favorite time of year. Um, uh yeah there's no shortage of trails i love the alleys of canmore i love the alleys of most communities um especially older communities you really see um like in, if you go and check out the alleys in kitsilano like it's similar to canmore you just sort of see the back ends of people's homes and it's less and less in south canmore as the old houses are coming down but um it's where i taught my kids how to walk and ride their bikes was in the alleys of Canmore. Um, and it was a really, it's a safe place and almost like a, a different sphere in terms of urban planning that people don't really see much or understand or even think to look at. When I when I decided to move it, so I, I, Canmore will always have a special place in my heart. And I say that, and this is going to sound really horrible, but I, I I I say it all the time to anyone who will listen to me. And I've got you here for a few extra minutes, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna say this on the record. Um, I lost my partner to a drunk driver in uh, 2009, 
And one of our favorite shows was filmed in Canmore. And it was only the first three episodes that was filmed in Canmore. And in it, the one, the, the, the main character, uh, Treat Williams, who unfortunately just passed from a motorcycle accident. Uh, it's called Everwood, whoever watched it on CW. Um, he lost his uh, wife to a drunk driver as well. And his wife told him that you'll find my spirit in, at that time, it was, Canmore was being played as a town in, the, uh, I think, in Colorado. And I fell in love with that community. And after that accident, it took me a few years because I went through some things for myself. The first moment I could after moving out west when I got a job in Lloydminster, Alberta, was to drive down to Canmore and reconnect. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you, and this is just, this is not blowing smoke. This is just a conversation between you and I. Canmore is one of those communities that you drive into and you don't want to leave. Mm -hmm. And I, and, and I truly respect the fact that Canmore has carved out a place on the map for itself and has become the sort of shining example of yes, yet again, things, all communities have their challenges and tribulations, but you seem to be doing it right in that community. And in the 10 years that, or 13 years you've been there, it seems like you have a strong sense of what the long game is going to be in your community. So I want to thank you for doing that, first off, before I ask my last question. But I also want to say, if you ever, ever get a chance to visit Alberta and you're heading out to Banff, please stop in at Canmore. Go visit some of these incredible locations that the counselor has just said, because you get there, you will not want to leave. And there is a air about Canmore that I cannot explain to anyone. You just have to experience it. So there's my That's sort of so kind, Chris. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I and that's really actually your words are really rejuvenating to me because we have seen a lot of challenges in the last couple of years. And you know, there's always that juxtaposition between growth and change and not. And my hometown doesn't look the same as it did when I left it 20 years ago. But, um, you know, the last couple of years have been hard. So I really appreciate those kind words. I think we have a beautiful community. And, and what I'm in love with in my community is the soul of it, the people. Like you can look outside and you can, you know, Canmore doesn't look the way it does by accident. We have a really strong land use bylaw, et cetera. But it really is the people that make or break a town. And so I have been working really hard to try and retain those people. And the number one way to do that is to find them a place to live. Before so, I let you go, I have one last yeah. question for you. And it's the most important question I think I've asked in this hour long interview. And that is, in your opinion, and this is, you can take as long as you want to answer this question, but in your opinion, what makes the town of Canmore such a unique place to live to work and to raise a family. I would say what makes it such a unique place is it that it's dedication again to what I just mentioned to the soul, to the people. And um you know, I a few years back we had a large public hearing uh, and and during that public hearing I really felt that people were being othered. And I really was struggling with that. And I really wasn't allowed to speak out about it because I was meant to listen. It's a public hearing. But I went and had some stickers made and they say Canmore for everyone on them. And it's um, uh, one of those uh, sort of, you know, cheesy sort of statements. But really what it meant for me was um, this community that welcomes everyone. And so, you know, I live on one of the oldest streets in Canmore, Hospital Hill is what it's called, it's where the old hospital used to be, Three Sisters Drive. And when I moved here, we had, it was all like old miners and bartenders and carpenters. And I was the bartender at the time. Um, and now we've seen a lot of change on our street, a lot of new homes, ours also one of them. Um, but, you know, there was a staff house and it was fine. And there was, you know, the junk house. People used to joke our old house was like we were Mr. and Mrs. Sanford, that like Sanford and Son. I don't know if you're old enough to remember that show, 
but you know, <laughs> um, I have never and, felt and, more old than I do right now. Thank you know. for doing <laughs> And then, you know, some broken down houses some bougie houses, but everybody was a Canmorite. Uh, to ourselves, we are Canmorons. To the outside world, we are Canmorites. Um, uh, and so, you know, just this this inclusive community uh, that is really focused on taking care of each other. And, you know, that really became clear in the 2013 floods um, where everybody was opening up their homes to everybody else and, uh, and not just their homes, their wallets, their times, their community centers, um, all of those things. And, and during the pandemic, uh, at the first, you know, part of it, it's the same way. And so I really feel like we have a caring, caring community and we all want to see each other do the very best. And, um, and I think that's, that's, what's really special about our town. I am sure every other counselor out there would say the exact same thing about their community too. Um, but I've really had an opportunity to dig in to this community in the last 22 years in a way I didn't have growing up anywhere else. I went to 11 different schools between kindergarten and grade 13. So uh, moving around was my jam. I was actually, you know, moving around as a kid, you know, having to reinvent yourself at every new town. It was kind of like being, I was, I was meant to be a politician because <laughs> uh, I, that's the joke. Um, yeah, I just. I, I have I one. I, I was going to ask you did, but I have, I was going to not, I, was, I wasn't going to ask this, but I'm going to ask it now because we're ending off the interview and it's kind of a, what would you think? But do you think Don would be proud of you? Yes. 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 He was his friends, his, his, his fogies tell me all the time. Um, uh, and I still know some of those, you know, even the speakeasies of Cam of Hamilton still recognize me, which is nice. Um, and Don was known everywhere. Like he had a place everywhere, which was, and, and like the North end is where he grew up and those were his people. Those were my people. Um, so yes, he would be very proud of me. And, uh, yeah. And, and he well, didn't have kids or anything, but he, I was one of his kids and, uh, and, I, and I carry some of, he was, a, he was a salty dude <laughs> and, and I carry some of his salt around with me for sure. Cause, uh, sometimes you just have to look at people and go, so, uh, so on the flip side, I I know I see, keep on saying my yeah. last question, but on the flip side, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I do you know. do you yeah, feel like company. do you do you feel like taking do you do you feel a responsibility to do what Don did to you with other counselors or other prospective counselors? Yeah, when you absolutely. when you see them or even across Alberta when you meet them at Alberta municipalities conferences or FCM conferences to take people under the wing and saying, you know what, you've got a good head on your shoulders, you're doing it for the right yeah. reason. Yeah, I and I yes, I have uh, been lucky enough to um, band up with a few younger counselors from other communities um, around Alberta. Um, I this is actually my last term. Uh, I made that decision at the beginning of it, and I did so because I know that to making decision to become a counselor isn't something you just decide at the last minute. It's a large responsibility to fit into your life, and so I wanted to give. Um, you know, other citizens that might be interested in this, the opportunity to think about it and ask me questions without any consequence to their questions. And so, um, you know, last month was that like two years away from the end of the term. And I put a big like doo -doo 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 on Facebook saying, if anybody wants me to buy the coffee, I will buy the coffee and talk to them about what it means. And that this town is always going to need excellent, passionate level-headed leaders and I'm happy to ask any of the questions and provide any advice on on how to run a campaign and how to run a campaign in in the new age like we're actually looking at banning campaign signs in our community um which 
I think, you know, is a really great idea. Please, Something please do that across happen. Alberta. <laughs> yeah, right? Like, it's such a waste. Um, and it doesn't mean, well, banning campaign campaign signs, sorry, on public property. That's my, that's my oh. beef. Like, you want it on your private property, have at her, but it's the public, the proliferation of them on private, public property that really is annoying to me uh, and really is meaningless. Oh, look, I can put a sign in the ground. Yippee. So, so, um, but anyways, yes, that is what I do. Paying it forward is a big thing. And, um, you know, reaching back specifically to women when I was elected I had an 18 month old strapped to my back and a four-year-old in hand. And, um, it was me and six old white men and I'm still good friends with most of those guys. Uh, but it, um, it was new to them and it was new to me. Uh, and, um, but I, I think especially there is a place for women in politics, um, and municipal is a really great spot to be in. You can really have some focused change, but again, it's a long game and I've had the luxury of a long game and it's been a luxury and it's been a luxury given to me by the people of Canmore. Joanna, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. Um, not often do I get to come into an interview and start laughing off the bat <laughs> and actually have an informative, just open, honest conversation with somebody. And it is uh, my honor and my pleasure to have just to get to know you over the last hour. I'm looking forward to visiting Canmore, hopefully going out to grab a coffee with you. And then we can sit down and just do this more off the record. And we could possibly yeah. <laughs> drop a few uh, curse words from time to time. But I also want to no thank you. <laughs> I also want to thank you for serving your community. I truly do not think municipal leaders hear that enough because I think you are the most important level of government in our society, but you do not get the credit you as municipal leaders deserve. So thank you. Thank you for serving. Thank you for being part of the show. And thank you for making Canmore a great place and being Joanna from Canmore. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's very kind. Thank you for joining us for another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. Your continued interest in delving deep into the issues that shape our communities across Canada is both inspiring and essential to our mission. Now, as we ramp up, it is my hope that you have gained valuable insights into the intricate world of municipal politics from our guest today. Now, if you found this dialogue as engaging as I did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. By subscribing, you're not just staying up to date with our latest conversations, but you're playing a vital role in supporting our endeavor to bring you more meaningful content. Now, we couldn't embark on this journey without your support. Creating content that sheds light on the issues affecting municipalities requires dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help us to continue to grow, please visit our support page conveniently linked in the show notes or by visiting crossborderinterviews.ca. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can keep delivering the kind of content that you have come to expect from us. Once again, thank you for being part of the Cross Border Interviews community. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter in Canada. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.